Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and we have only got four weeks to go to get the Alfa on the road, so this week I'm going to start moving on to the front suspension. So last week you saw me come under here. I refit the diff to the car and uh, started sort of reassembling everything. I had made a couple of mistakes that uh, the Alpha guys pointed out. Um, yeah, I, I sort of didn't think it was right at the time that uh, I put the uh, handbrake cable on the wrong side of the diff. It should actually go the other way. So I'll take that off now and flip that around. Same with the uh, the limiting straps. I actually put the bolts on this side, which is actually where the, uh, the springs and shocks go. Uh, so uh, those, this uh, hardware should actually be on this side of the limit strap. So just a couple of minor little things that I needed to, to flip around. Uh, the only other thing was uh, the fact that I kept the trunnion arm in the back for the diff. There are other options. I could have built a, uh, a different framework and made um, uh, a couple of individual top control arms that would save a bit of weight. Uh, but... The way I looked into it at the time, the reason I went with the trunnion arm, keeping the trunnion arm, was just uh, simplicity. It was just easier to keep the trunnion arm in there and uh, and make the uh, the bearing system uh, than going through and doing the uh, uh, individual arms. And I can always change that later if uh, if I choose to. But uh, at this stage, I'm happy with this option. So uh, let's correct some of the things that I messed up. So now that I've redone the rear handbrake cable and the limiting straps, I'm fitting in the rear sway bar, which I hadn't done last week either. All right, so next step is to refit the wheel hubs with some nice new wheel bearings. Now, before I do this, um, a long time ago, I actually talked with Colin Byrne, who um, has a very good YouTube channel, who built one of these old 105s and uh, has actually been building a Lancia Stratos as well um, for Tarmac Rally. And he's had a lot of experience in Tarmac Rally and driving uh, particularly 105s quite a lot and was having a lot of issues with pad knockoff. So if you know what that is, is basically um, you might even see a race car drivers often uh, will be tapping the brakes a little bit down the main straights and that's often because of pad knockoff so basically um, with the wheel moving around a long time between braking intervals the pads sort of get pushed away from the caliper so they take a lot more pedal to grab hold of the brake caliper and you're finding that you feel like there's there's not enough brakes so if you get the pads back close to the disc again they'll actually grab quickly and you actually get um, uh, a good solid brake and particularly Colin was noticing on a tarmac rally car where it's it's roads, it's street, it's not nice smooth racetracks, it's it's country roads and uh, the bouncing around and, and not much movement between. He spent a lot of time trying to find out where this pad knockoff was and he thought originally it was on the rear and he did a lot of work on changing the rear. Then he tried changing the front, he changed the needle bearings, he changed all sorts of things to try and find out where this pad knockoff was coming from. And it turns out it's because this, this spindle uh, from the Alpha originally is a little bit weak and a little bit flexible, uh, particularly in extreme conditions. So what he came up with to solve that is this. So what this is, is this is a spacer that goes onto the standard spindle, if I can get this off. And basically what this does, is a spindle and there's a few little shims that he sent with the, um, the spacer. And what this does is this does a couple of things. It basically, uh, it thickens up and firms up the factory spindle and gives it a fair bit more strength, but it also makes it so that you can actually 
tighten it down. Anyone who's changed a uh, front wheel bearing, usually you tighten it down until it starts to sort of, the, uh, the bearing starts to grab and then you lock it off and you put the pin through it. Well, in this case, um, you can tighten it down as hard as you like because it's pressing against the spacer and not locking the bearings up. So you can actually get a nice firm front hub the bearings will live longer and you're not going to have the problem with the pad knockoff and this, this solved his issues. And he spent a lot of time testing lots of different things and, uh, and worked out what it was. And so um, if any of you want any of these, uh, he does have um, uh, a few sets and he can make some more up. Uh, uh, I'll put a link in the description to, uh, to, to these, but uh, these are definitely going to be fitted. So let's start um, redoing the bearings and getting ready to fit some spacers. All right, so I replaced the inner part of the bearings, pressed them out. Um, I always find the smaller one easier than the, uh, the, uh, the larger one because the larger one you obviously can't press from this side because you can't get a thing the same size as the bearing through the center of the bore. Um, and I just used a socket extension to sort of knock it uh, down all the way around and got the uh, bottom bearing out. Now it's time to replace the bearings. Now I got one of these uh, bearing grease filler things uh, ages ago. Junk, don't bother. Uh, I've never found these things to be that effective. Just using a big, putting some gloves on, using a big dollop of grease in your hand and working the grease into the bearing on your hand is the best method I've found. Uh, yeah, don't worry with this stuff. Just put the grease in and, uh, and grease them up and get them on. All right, bearings are replaced, and now I'm gonna go through and start fitting my discs, which have been kicking around uh, my workshop for a while. I've got a little bit of service rust on them, but they are monster things from C12 Racing that go with the six-spot calipers on the front. These are really about as big as you're gonna get that fit on any 15-inch wheels for the, uh, for the Alpha. Uh, and I'm going through and replacing all the studs, and um, I'm gonna go through now and press in the, uh, the new wheel studs into the disc, and then we can start mounting things up. I've slid the rear bearing onto the spline and uh, onto the spindle and I've put Colin's uh, spacer in there and he supplies it with a couple of shims and so well, I'm gonna put a, a tiny one shim on first and just test it and see if it's got the right amount of tension for what we're looking for. So um, I'll put the other bearing in, bolt it up and then check, the, do the wheel, regular wheel bearing check but you should be able to tighten it right up and this should still be able to move um, and you use these shims to get that exact right tolerance rather than tightening the, uh, the nut up all the way or not. Uh, should lock it up nice and tight and give a nice solid front end. All right, and now I realized I can't find the uh, cap, the dust cover to go over that, but that's basically done. We have a, uh, a wheel, that one shim was enough. Uh, on the other side, I ended up using two just to get the, uh, the right spacing. It's just how these things are, and that is beautiful. So now we have a nice turning wheel, uh, no slop, no play, and uh, hopefully it won't have that brake knockoff problem and it's firming up the front end. Particularly with this car, I want good brakes. All right, guys, well, it's time now to sort out the steering on this car once and for all. Now, uh, those following from the start will have known that I converted from a steering box to a steering rack uh, to fit the engine for better steering, all that sort of stuff, um, as this originally had the steering box. And I got this rack from a wrecker. It was in a bunch of Toyota wrecking parts, and it had um, a Toyota part number on it. I think it was originally, they thought it was from a Toyota Corolla. I then went and ordered um, tie rods for it and realized 
it's not a Toyota Corolla steering rack uh, because the Toyota Corolla stuff doesn't work. I did some research and, um, and bought some more tie rods for it. And I, because uh, I think I found out it was a Suzuki Swift steering rack. That also doesn't fit because this is a male end and there's a male end on the rack itself. So I looked further and uh, I think I found out what it is. I'm pretty sure it is actually from a Holden Barina, which is basically the Holden version of the Suzuki Swift. But either way, this is a Barina tie rod that actually fits onto the, um, the steering rack. So that is what we're going to uh, swap over onto there. And then we have to start looking at the actual tie rod ends because this old tie rod end um, doesn't fit properly. And uh, yeah, we've well, got something else going for that. All right, so uh, I played around with this steering rack when I put it in a long time ago to try and work out bump steer. Now, I put a link up above so you can go back and have a look at that to fully grasp what bump steer uh, entails. But basically what it means is you need to get the relationship of the steering arm uh, moving in the same vein as the suspension is. Otherwise, if you go over a bump, uh, the steering arm um, will, will pull the wheel in a, in a direction if they use bump steer. And you can get it really, really wrong very easily. Um, so what I've got here is I've actually got some uh, tie rod ends that are bump steer adjustable. And they've got a couple of different little spaces here. Uh, I believe they're made for drift cars. These are for uh, um, uh, S13, which just happens to be the same thread as what the tie rods are for this car. So I'm gonna go through now and by using these different heights, depending on the height of where this uh, attaches to the steering arm is, uh, will factor is where the bump steer is going to sit and how it's gonna be. All right, and I've got my uh, bump stop adjusted tie rod ends in. I calculated bump steer in the past and just double checked it and it's all looking good. My basic double check is just, I stuck a level against the disc, moved it through its travel and watched where the level lined up on the front guard of the car and just made sure that it didn't sort of swing. And it was like almost completely dead true. So uh, a very good, uh, very good bump steer. So happy with that. So next thing I think is to stick on some calipers. <laughs> oh, how good does it look with the wheels and brakes on? Now I still have to get that dust cover for the, um, the front hub. Uh, that's not right. I'm gonna have to uh, do something about these wheel nut bolts, but uh, that's details. Um, one thing I will mention is uh, for the tyres on the our Ferrari, I wanted something that was going to be sort of a good compromise track street tyre. Um, and uh, I've gone with the uh, Zestino Gredge 07Rs, which um, I've actually got the, the more track focused ones on the Rockster. So um, on the Rockster, I have 140 Treadwear, very sticky road legal rubber. That's what I've got on the on the rocks. So these are 240 tread wear. So something a little bit harder wearing for more daily driver use, but still be nice and sticky when you get into it on the track and uh, and, and on the corners. A good enthusiast car tire. Um, like I mentioned, when I put them on the Rockster, I've got a bunch of mates have been using these, particularly track day guys have been using these for quite some time, um, and they're uh, and they're they're really good. So. Um, I am happy to have them on the Al Ferraris. They are uh, 205 15s. They're not the biggest wheel and tire for this car and, and it's a square setup, so it's the same tires all the way around. But um, I think there's just gonna be just right. I don't want to break things. So uh, having a little bit of um, give in the tires, uh, a bit of sl potential slip is not a bad thing. So uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see how it all goes once they're uh, it's actually out on the on the road. But yeah, I'm very happy with this. So let's go around. Let's put on the rest of the tyres and uh, and maybe just sit down on the ground just so I can see it.
Oh, how good does it look? That is roughly, roughly ride height. And yeah, I am, I am really loving it. I think that looks awesome. Um, I still have to do a little bit of adjustment with the, uh, the camber and caster and things like that. Uh, the front wheel's got a heap of camber on it and it's, uh, uh, it's tucked right in at the top. So I have to uh, adjust that uh, camber arm and, and, and things like that and get the, um, the fitment just right. But wow, <laughs> this is the first time I've ever had it sitting down on four wheels sort of at ride height, uh, roughly how it's going to look. And uh, oh, it looks good. Now, some of you may have noticed that I still haven't installed springs and shocks. Uh, I did mention it last week in the video as well. Um, I have something uh, very special coming, but it's not quite ready yet. I'm hoping by the end of next week, I will have the springs and shocks. So it's still not, um, be able to sit on its own weight as yet, but uh, we are very, very close on that front. <sighs> but wow, how good is it looking? It is, it just, it's feeling so much closer to a real car when you can actually see it on wheels and on the ground and, oh, I like it. All right, round two at the windscreens. I've got Tim here from Zootocraft uh, who's done lots of these. So I've got him giving me a hand and Fingers crossed, we'll get the windows in this time and she'll be buttoned up. Oh, I hate this job. So having two people definitely helps with this, but lining the window up pretty close on the outside to start with helps. And then using the string, pulling it all the way around the edges and basically that helps fold the inner lip over the aperture all the way around. It takes a lot of sort of banging and bashing and hitting and pushing and uh, yeah, we get there in the end. <laughs> but uh, I hate this job. One in, that one in, not too, not too badly. <laughs> Let's see how the back one goes. So I have to have another big thanks to Tim at Zoo Autocraft. He uh, really helped me out with this one. He's done a bunch of these windows and uh, just having a bit of knowledge really, really helps. And uh, we got it in without too much hassle. So thanks again, Tim. All right, so now the glass is in. Oh, it looks so good. Uh, it's time to actually start putting the front end together and basically button up the exterior of the car. And, um, that means this front end grill lights uh, and all that sort of stuff. The first thing I'm going to start with is horns. All right, so horns are something that uh, I actually forgot about until uh, just recently. It's one of those extra little things you don't necessarily think about when you're doing all the major bits of the builds, all those little tiny bits and pieces. Um, I did wire it in when I did the wiring, but um, what I did is actually, uh, when I was working on the Rockstar, I pulled the front end off and uh, for some reason, the previous owner still left the factory horns and then put these things in with it. These things so were extra with the factory horns. The factory horns still seem to work. These still seem, well, I don't know. Anyway, these are nice and small, perfect for what I need. So I'm going to make a couple of mounts up and just sort of mount them up underneath the, uh, um, the grill here somewhere and, uh, and wire them in. And then we can start looking at doing the grills and headlights and stuff. All right, so horns are in and wired up, which means I can move forward now. I don't have to uh, go back and do any of that stuff later. Uh, I can put the front end on and leave it on where it's supposed to be. Now, headlights. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the horrible trends that seems to be popular lately is chucking hideous headlights on the front of these old classic cars. There's no place for the robot vomit, horrible, ugly headlights for these cars. It just ruins them. Uh, in saying that, I still want to improve the, uh, the ability of these headlights a, a bit. And uh, I am not going with the complete originals, but I have got replacement fluted headlights um, that are H4 uh, bulbs. So these 
originally had H1 bulbs, which are much smaller and don't really have the uh, the output that the H4s. Uh, you've got a much bigger range of globes and all the rest of it. So um, I have gone with brand new H4s. The old ones were looking a bit tired. These are all nice and shiny. So I've got the smaller for the uh, for the inner and the outer, and these are just off the shelf sizes. So uh, now it is a matter of trying to fit them up. So um, I actually also got the buckets, the adjusting buckets. Because these headlights are different, the original ones had mountings on the, the, the globe part itself um, that are different on the, the modern ones. I've got more modern mountings so I can um, aim the directions and stuff. The, uh, the inner ones are pretty straightforward. It's the outer ones that are gonna take a bit more work, but let's, uh, let's get the inner ones on to start with and uh, see how they look. the inner headlights are in with the adjusters and uh, they're mounted in and they're good so now I need to start doing the outers the uh, the bigger headlights and I bought some new adjusters because like I mentioned before the other factory headlights actually have the mountings on it to use the original uh, stuff and uh, the the modern headlights don't have that they're designed for a different housing and that's what this is the only thing is is that this is too big for what I'm using the uh, this sort of design is not going to work. So what I need to do is I need to actually take uh, the original bucket and adapt it to work with the uh, the adjuster here. And the way they adjust is uh, they have these screws and there's a couple of them that are 90 degrees to each other. So you can adjust the headlights up and down and left and right. I need to modify these. I need to cut the back off of them because they will no longer fit with my air filters and things like that that I've got in here. Um, the, uh, the back of the new headlights, I've got rubber mountings and stuff, so they're designed to uh, um, be sealed at the back, unlike the original ones. So, uh, so let's start cutting and modifying and seeing if we can get this housing to work in this bucket. All right, that was a lot of messing around to get the headlight buckets all in and uh, all sitting there and then also the chrome ring surrounding them and all that sort of stuff. They're all in now and all looking good. I will have to pull them out again because I haven't wired them. I just, before I mess around getting everything working perfectly, I can do that later. Um, next thing is I want to put the grill in. Now, some of you might remember that I spent a lot of time making some brass uh, custom grills for this car and I sent them away and got them chromed and they look fantastic. Uh, camera's probably not picking that up, but they look really, really good in Chrome. So uh, now I need to go through and um, fit up the 3D printed grills that I made for them. Um, I've got all of them still sitting there. So the grills need to be uh, attached to the Chrome and then the Chrome fitted to the car. So let's do that. I absolutely love how these turned out. Uh, just from an idea in my head to making the surrounds out of brass and then designing up and 3D printing the, uh, the grills themselves. Just, they just really came up fantastic. I'm very happy. So now let's uh, go and mount them in the car and uh, see what it all looks like.
that was very, very fiddly. Uh, just going through and getting everything lined up. <sighs> Next time I make grills or something like that, I think I won't make hidden fasteners. I might make them sort of deep inside or something where I can go through and put like a black fastener in the background rather than trying to do up an Allen key from the back with no room. And yeah, I didn't think that through, but <laughs> I'll learn. But it's looking great. The uh, grills came up fantastic. I love the chrome. Still have badges to go. Still have uh, springs and shocks to come. I have run out of time. I don't have time to put the bonnet on today. I've still got stuff to do about the bonnet window and stuff like that to get that finished up. So we're gonna have to leave that. So I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. After the success of the Ferrari FXX, which was a track-only version of the Ferrari Enzo, Ferrari unveiled the 599XX at the 2009 Geneva Motor Show. As with the FXX, the 599XX was a track-only car that was only offered to Ferrari's top customers. Based on the road-going 599, the XX gained over 100 horsepower to make 720 horsepower. Weight was reduced with extensive use of carbon fibre, including the intake manifold. The interior was a minimalist race version with sliding Lexing windows, although the air conditioning was retained for driver comfort. Aerodynamics were greatly improved with winglets on the C pillars, carbon fibre ducktail spoiler and a large rear diffuser. The 599XX also has two fans under the car to suck it to the ground where it can increase downforce up to 250 kilometers per hour, where the other aero will take over as it will switch off as it's no longer needed. The car is reported to generate 280 kilos of downforce at 200 k's an hour and 630 kilos of downforce at 300 k's an hour. It also had F1 derived wheel donuts for brake cooling alongside bonnet vents and other ducts. 2011, the F99XX Evo was released with more aero and other updates. A total of 44 599XXs were produced. And for a brief moment, they held the Nürburgring lap record for a production-derived sports car at six minutes and 58 seconds. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am so happy with how this is looking. It is, it's, it's almost there. It's almost like, at least on the outside, it's almost done. Yeah. It needs a bonnet and uh, some exhaust pipes and that's about it. I am, I am so happy with how this looks. It's so good. And the other bonus is, is I got some of this stuff done actually quicker than I was expecting. And uh, next week I may actually start getting things ready to try and start the car. There's still a fair bit of stuff to do. There's fuel to get up there. There's power. Uh, there's still a bunch of wiring to do and stuff like that. So we'll see how we go. But that is my aim is to start getting it ready and fingers crossed it may start at the show. It won't be rolling and driving. It might not have all the cooling and all the other stuff, but it might actually crank over and that would be a huge milestone. Oh, that's a high five, man. <laughs> it's not there yet. Is it a belly bump? <laughs> Let's you're, do it. You're a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> like, subscribe, up to bell on Patreon and we'll see you next time. See you guys. Based on the road going F99. 599. <laughs> Based on the road going F99, the X. 599. Oh my god. Based on the road going 599. The interior was a minimalist race version, including with sliding. Aerodynamics were greatly improved with ducklets on the wingtails. <laughs> you mean winglets on the ducks? <laughs> or something Duck like that? Ducktail spoiler and winglets. <laughs> to the ground to increase downforce up to. 250 kilometers an hour. That's exactly right. So it's sucked down to the ground where it increases downforce to 250, well, up to 250k an hour. Start again. <laughs> no, I was getting there. <laughs> you were 